Welcome back to Our Fresh Story, the podcast where we have conversations about brave decisions to start over again. I'm Olivia. And I'm Jenny. And we're so glad you're here today. Well, hello, 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 sister. Bonjour. Fancy meeting you here at Riverside. <laughs> this the side of rivers. We've... The side of rivers, yeah. Uh, I'd love to meet you on a riverside. Have a little picnic. Maybe Thomas can write a song about that. I feel like that's like a good song. The side of rivers. Anyway, he is C. Graves. Yeah, he is C. Uh, so, um, I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> you ready for this little story? Yeah, it goes yeah. along with the episode. Okay. So, the bus comes at 8.20. So, we leave the house at 8.15 to walk okay. down to the bus stop. My son is in fifth grade. Which at some point you have to kind of like, kind of have to start noticing what's happening with your homework yourself without your mom checking all the time. And at 8.13, he remembers that he has a project due that day, of which he has to have two songs that he has to write an introduction for, for his media class. And basically like, you know, do what we're doing now, which is introduce the songs. And I said, well, you have one minute per song to figure this out before we leave for the bus. We ran through our list of songs. He ultimately did not like anything I decided that he should do. Uh, He chose Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes, which we listen to in the car all the time. So he does know that one. And then I forced him to use um, All You Need Is Love because everybody knows All You Need Is Love. Anyway, he was mad at me because I recommended these songs and so the the walk to the bus was really super fun with that and i then had to take a nice mile long walk myself to decompress from that rage um of having to come up with a project two minutes before the bus i just had a really funny thing happened our mother her soul flew across the atlantic and actually Uh slammed into my body (laughs) and she i'm liz now and I need to say, how do you think I felt when I was driving you at five in the morning to school Yeah, for a trip to go to Boston in March? And I said, do you have pants? Yes. Do you have shoes? Yes. Do you have socks? Yes. Do you have a coat? No, I don't need a coat. Do you, How do you think that? Me? That, I did this? Yes, you did that. And I then vaguely two remember. Two years later, mm-hmm. Olivia March, my daughter. I'm still Liz now, right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you think I felt when I was driving your sister to the same trip to Boston you had no and March? Socks. Yeah. That's the punchline. Thank Sorry. you for that. <laughs> well, again, why was people not I'm checking kidding. that we had this stuff though? <laughs> Cut <What>? that. <laughs> I don't know. My point, being, saying... my point being, I'm sure she thought at that I'm age not that. we had a certain responsibility to I mean, you know, I make sure we had a coat. I agree. Sock. Make sure you and had your coat. My point being, the mom rage is real and the mom rage is generational and the mom rage goes on and on. Mom and rage you're is frozen, societal. So I don't know mom if rage. You're getting any Speaking of, of mom rage, we talked. My point, my point is yeah. the mom rage is real. And even when you have very good kids, as your kid is very yeah. good, yeah. and yeah. we were very good kids. I did think that it was a better idea to wear the free pads that you get at the shoe store than socks because I didn't like the way socks looked. I'm actually wearing two pairs of socks now, so I'm making up for it in my in my adult life. <laughs> and But my point is, the mom yeah. rage is very real. It is a confluence of things that make the mom rage happen. And we were very lucky to get to talk to the author, Minna Dubin, about yep. her book, Mom Rage. Mom Rage, yeah. Which is all the rage, by the way. In this. <laughs> Thank but, um, you. I was saving okay, that wait. one. Mom just left my body, so okay. she's back. Uh, she's it was there. all the she's rage in, uh, in, um, all over the internet right now. It's Mom Rage. And I yeah. think the important thing about this book and, and what she's doing is giving a voice to these feelings for women. Yes, giving a name to it It's not just about Mom even. Rage. It's about, yeah. about women's rage. It's about all these things, yeah. right? So... It was a beautiful conversation about art and writing and parenting and womanhood. So please enjoy this episode with Minna Dubin. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to a fresh story so that we can keep telling fresh start stories. Minna Dubin is the author of Mom Rage, the Everyday Crisis of Modern Motherhood. Her writing has been featured in the New York Times, Oprah Daily, the Times Sunday Magazine, Salon, Lit Hub, Parents, Romper, and elsewhere. 
She is the recipient of an Artist Enrichment Grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. As a leading feminist voice on Mom Rage, Mina has ap- appeared on MSNBC, Good Morning America, The Tamron Hall Show, the BBC, and NPR. And she lives in Berkeley, California with her husband, two kids, and no pets because enough is enough. And I really understand that. <laughs> um, and I am in a writer, mom writer Facebook group with you. That's how I know you. And mm-hmm. I remember back a long time ago when, when mom rage was like a, just a kernel of, you know, like when you were kind of like putting out there, you know, does anybody else feel this? And should we talk about it? And I'm so excited that this book is in the world because it's so necessary to have this conversation because mom rage is real and we need to be talking about it. So I really appreciate you being here today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And yes, it has been a long journey with mom rage. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) How are you doing today? Um, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I got the kids off to school. Mm-hmm. I ate a breakfast. Win. So yep. I feel like I'm like winning in all categories. I made yep. coffee. Everything is great. That's, yeah, it's early there. It's still, it's, what time is it there? It's 9.30. 930. Yeah, 9.30 yeah. in the morning. Yeah, it's early. So you're just at the beginning of your day. You're winning. Today you're winning. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. ahead of the game today. Um, well, awesome. Well, this is perfect. Why don't you take us back to the beginning of your Fresh Start story? Sure. So I had, um, I had my first child in 2012 and I more or less quit working. I was teaching creative writing workshops for teens and I just kind of, my, my fellowship ended about six months after I had my kid and I just was like, okay, I'm going to be a full-time mom. I'm going to try it out for a little while. Mm -hmm. And, um, that basically lasted until he was two and, I, it was not, I was not doing so great. Like it was not, it was not as fulfilling for me. I found it challenging. I felt like I was just mom. I had completely stopped writing. Um, so I think, and and I was feeling mom rage. I was, I was feeling really extremely irritated constantly. Uh, I think my sleep was constantly disrupted and he was like not napping during the day and it was making me insane. We were Mm -hmm. I was driving him every day for hours on the highway mm-hmm. and it, it felt like it was I, my life felt like it had become not my life like yeah. it just felt, I don't know yeah. so when he was about two in 2015 um I uh I started writing I just I put him in daycare I put him in more child care than we had had him in uh which felt like a scary decision because like I wasn't making money and yeah. it was like, well, can I really put him in childcare if I'm not making yeah. money? Like it felt sort of selfish and Yes. I want to uh, go back frivolous. to that later. Yeah, that's yeah. an important conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I took myself out of the house because when I'm in the house and yeah. I sit down to write, I don't write because I should be doing something that is tangible and for the home, like laundry or cooking or mm-hmm. cleaning. And I took myself to a coffee shop and I stared at my computer and looked at the white page, which is like the scariest thing ever for a writer. Mm-hmm. And I started writing lists about motherhood. I didn't know what my writing project was going to be. I didn't know. And I started this three year long art, uh, public art project called mom lists where I wrote these lists about motherhood that were, they were sort of just like my experience of what I was seeing and yeah. both in the world as a mother and how I was right. being treated. And also like I was telling motherhood stories. Um, and so they were like mini memoirs kind of, but in list version, because I, I think my brain was still sort of foggy in this way that like lists mm-hmm. were all I knew how to do. I'm, I'm very listy too. I'm a Virgo. Yeah. I'm like, you know, everything is listy yeah, in precise. my life. So it was like, it was like a way into writing. And one of those lists that I wrote was called a parenting street scene. And it was my first list that I ever wrote that, or anything I ever wrote about mom rage. Mm. And that felt like a real, I was putting the lists in addition to putting the lists in public spaces around the Bay area. I did this project for three years. I also was taking pictures of them and posting them on social media. Mm. And this particular list felt like a very vulnerable list to post And I got this big response to that list. And so eventually I put all those lists into a manuscript and wrote essays to go with some of the lists. I picked Mm. maybe eight lists that had an essay that followed them. And that was one of the lists that I wrote an essay for. And then that essay got published by the New York times. And that, and that was sort of the beginning of, of, and then I got this huge response from mothers from all over the world to that yeah. essay. And that was sort of the beginning of me 
really thinking about Momridge as a topic that might need more uh, investigation and that I might want to look at. Hmm. I have a couple of things. So I, how you're, you put these lists up around in the Bay area. What was the, like in what medium? So the lists were on five, uh, five by seven cards, like that you would get at like, you know, mm-hmm. an office store, you know, yep. per, the, you, they come in little packs and they're different colors. So it's like yeah. purple, green, blue, no, yellow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and one side they're lined and one side yep, they're okay. not lined. Mm-hmm. So I was writing on the not lined side uh, in like black pilot pen. And then I was taking a piece of decorative paper, like be- some kind of, I was getting all this beautiful decorative paper and I would cut it to be five by seven and I would use a, uh, book binding all it's like a yeah, it's like, like a circle thing with the mm-hmm, point mm-hmm, e mm-hmm. anyway and i would punch holes in it right, through that right. and then use book binding thread and sew the the beautiful piece over the over the list mm-hmm. and then i would put a ribbon on them so that they would they could hang by the ribbon and so i would put them in like you know bulletin boards and coffee shops and yoga studios and uh laundromats like anywhere that i could think of yeah and then you would have to you'd have to lift the, t- the top layer right which is this pretty layer to get to this like pretty gritty <clears throat> list yeah. about motherhood so you mentioned before we started recording i mentioned that our mom is an artist and you mentioned that your mom is an interactive <laughs> sculptor is that right yes yes so this this feels connected to that which is the <laughs> motherhood coming through totally actually when i was trying to figure out uh, what what I was going to do for this project that I was starting to do, this mom list project. I ha- remember, I didn't even know if I'd written a list yet. I had uh, I had a phone call with her and she said, what if you made them into stickers and then you, you plastered the stickers all over the city? Yeah. Like on mailboxes and like, and mm-hmm. I was like, mom, that's like graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> Counterculture, baby. She yeah, she's totally <laughs> counterculture. But she like she's the one who gave me the idea to put them in the world. Like I hadn't yeah. I hadn't gotten there yet. Yeah. And so her idea is sort of what led me to post them in public places. You wonder like how much of her own mom rage that she from her motherhood like young motherhood days was being funneled into that. I'm sure she was excited to see that project come to light because it's I don't think it's anything that a mom can get away from. I don't think any mom can avoid the the rage and the frustration and the, you know, annoyance. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I, that project wasn't about mom rage, the mom list oh, project. Mm-hmm. I just had this one list that was right. over mm-hmm. 150. So, and, and I also don't remember my mother having mom rage or yelling at me, like, hardly at all. But I just didn't, I was just on, you know, the East Coast part of the tour for my book. And... And my uh, conversation partner, Joe Piazza, asked the asked the, the audience, raise your hand if you've ever had mom rage. And my mother raised her <laughs> hand. Yeah. <laughs> and it really Ooh. shocked me. Ooh. That's interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah, that's um, – I, I think that I'm not a mom, but I, I see it. And I think that whether we – express it or not it seems unavoidable it's a really hard circumstance we put women in yes yeah, mothers. Agreed. Yeah. yeah it is yeah so okay so you you put this what was the response first of all getting in the new york times is amazing right so what was your feeling when you saw your name in the new york times Oh, I mean, I was so excited. It was the largest outlet I'd ever had anything published in. Yeah. It is the largest outlet. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It was it was amazing. I definitely, like, it feels like a coup that I actually got a piece of writing in the New York Times. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, I was lucky. I had an agent at that time for this this list book that has never been published. It still lives <laughs> on my so hard drive. Right. Um, but it, it was that the agent helped, right? Yeah, like, I right. was So... It was part of a trajectory of like slowly getting published more and more. And like I was mm-hmm. I was moving towards that. But I was very excited to have it in the New York Times. I couldn't believe it. I was also absolutely terrified because of the content. Yeah. And like did a lot of work to like scrape my family's names from the internet. Like I called old places I had published and was like, can you change their names? Mm. So yeah, I went on Facebook and like, like, I just like, I did a lot of work to scrape my family from the internet. I don't blame you. People get so, people are so uncomfortable with the truths of parenthood. Yes. Right. And so when we talk about it, the reaction is often so negative and I would do the same thing. (laughs) I would do the exact same thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. So then you were in the Times, and then how did the book come to light, like the life of that book? So the essay was published in 2019. It was called The Rage Mothers Don't Talk About, and Mm -hmm. it went viral, but like, you know, had its moment, and then, you know, the world Mm -hmm. moved on. But then the pandemic happened in March, Mm -hmm. and they republished it in April, and I think it went more viral. Mm -hmm. Like, it got, you know, it just went nuts again, and then... I was just getting so many messages from people over the next couple months that I, I contacted the times cause now I had their contact. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I stopped actually that agent and I stopped working together by that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I contacted them and was like, I think that the pandemic and mom rage are connected right now yeah. and that we should write about it. So I wrote a second piece about mom rage and the pandemic that was published in July, 2020. And like at that point, mothers had been in the pandemic mm-hmm. for like three, three yeah. and a half mm-hmm. months. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it was just, it was very, very good timing. Yeah. And so that, that article, that was a reported article that went viral as well. And that's when agents started contacting mm-hmm. me being like, you need to write a book on this. And I was very much like, Oh no, 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 I'm not writing a book about mom rage. Like I have this other book that's about like the full experience of motherhood and not just about mom rage. And they were like, everyone was just kind of like, no, no. Yeah. 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 We don't want another book. That's about like nursing and sleep deprivation. And like, that's what every motherhood book is about. Well, what does that feel like then? Cause I'm sure your motherhood experience encompasses so much. That's not just mom rage, right? You're not just, yes. you know, walking around raging all the time. <laughs> yes. <I> can tell. <laughs> and so, like, you know, what does that feel like to sort of be known as the mom rage woman? Like, what has your experience been with that? Um, it, it's a mixed experience. It feels inaccurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because, of course, I'm not really walking around raging all the time. Right. And, and also, like, my child is 10 now. Like, when I wrote that essay or that first list, I think he was, like, three. Right. You know? So, like, my world has changed. My kids have grown up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I both, like, sort of don't like it because yeah. it feels like I'm being pigeonholed into this one identity that is just, like, really a, a sliver of my motherhood. Yeah. But also I'm grateful for it because – it's the way that I've been able to get work that I still think is important. Like I still yeah. think that the book that I ended up writing is an important book in the world. And I was it able is. to not make it, I was able to make it mine. Like I was still yeah. able to like write the beautiful writing that I wanted to do and like highlight mother's stories. Like I still made it a, a book that I feel proud of, even mm-hmm. though it's about a topic that doesn't encompass my whole life and when you look at most people's writing like unless it's like a full life memoir yeah. right usually we're picking a slice of life to write right. about right so yeah and it's as a mother who had a lot of rage during the pandemic um i think it's so important you've become a leader in a lot of ways of a, the giving women the permission giving mothers the permission to say no i have way more feelings about this than I'm allowed to actually voice to other people. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience in in just talking to the women around you, whether it was other writers or just people in your neighborhood? Were you surprised hearing some of these stories about their rage when they would start talking to you? Yeah. I mean, one of the beautiful things that has come out of writing about mom rage is that when I meet people and they, I mean, sometimes when I tell them about the book, but usually when they have read my work, because mm-hmm. sometimes I'll meet people, I'll like, I'll be out with my cousin and yeah. she'll like run into a friend of hers and she'll be like, this is my cousin, Minna. And she wrote, you know, <laughs> that piece. And the and the woman will be like, oh my God, you wrote that piece. I remember that piece. You yeah. know, like that's how big it was that like yeah. people remember it. And, yeah. and then they tell a mom rage story. Right. And, and there's. You know, I feel like I'm better. I'm always better at saying what I want to say in writing, which is why I'm a writer, right? Like I can express myself better Mm -hmm. in writing than just talking. Um, So I find that when people have read my work, then they want to, then they want to talk about it. And and it's, and it's beautiful. Like, you know, I'll be talking to like some, you know, 70 or 80 year old woman who's a grandmother at this point and she'll tell a mom rage story. And it's the first time she's ever told that mom rage story in her life. And then she'll talk to her friend, who's also a grandmother, and that woman will tell her a mom rage story. And, like, 
I just, I think it's amazing like that, that we're it sharing is. it and talking about it because we hold so much shame around it. Yeah. And so I feel like every time we talk about it, we're like unlocking just this yep. little shame piece totally. and letting it go. Yeah, totally, totally. And there's also, there's a huge element here of that women are just conditioned to not be able to talk about their feelings. Like, right, like we're just supposed to be happy all the time, especially, yeah. you know, from our, the way that kind of the millennials and up a little bit, you know, we, our, our mothers wanted us to just be happy, right? And um, to be a mom, especially a new mom and have that rage come up, you of course internalize that. You're like, right. You're like, what's wrong with me? Why am I feeling this much rage? And how come I'm screaming all the time and all of these things? And actually, and in my case, it, it's so little about the children. Oh yeah. Right. And so what was, what was there anything really interesting that you found in kind of doing writing the book that like people said to you or that you researched that you were like, Oh, this is actually a really interesting finding. Um, I mean, I agree that it is so little about the children. And I think that people don't, can't talk about particularly being an angry mother because it is the antithesis of the way that the world and yeah. particularly America, uh, you know, mythologizes mothers. Mm -hmm. And so you, you feel like an anti-mother and, and we think it's a personal problem. And so I think just like through the course of this work, I have, I have figured out that we can't all have an anger problem. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, like, that's, that's, yeah. that, that doesn't compute. That's not no. happening. <laughs> right. Right. So something bigger is going on here. Mm -hmm. So like that finding just, which really was like the thesis of the book yeah. um, mm -hmm. was like the biggest thing. And then I think one of the things that really surprised me um, was realizing that you don't actually have to be yelling to be rageful yeah. because I'm, because I'm such a yeller. Like I, I'm loud in my anger that mm -hmm. it, I hadn't even considered really that you could be silent oh, yeah. <laughs> and be, and be so angry. Mm -hmm. And so that was really interesting and felt really important in when, as I interviewed mothers to recognize mm. that, that rage comes in all forms. Yeah. 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 What do you see as the relationship between uh, rage and art? Because I know for me, art is a vessel to get a lot of my rage out. Do you feel similarly? Do you create art still and or have talked to other women that have used art as a therapy for their rage? Yeah. I mean, my book is, is art to me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like my writing is art. And so yeah. I feel like I use art and specifically writing, but you know, mm -hmm. with the mom list project, it was also sort of visual, um, to process my experience mm -hmm. and right. to, to know, and to know myself in a way like writing helps me understand my situation. Mm -hmm. It can help me also like see it with some levity. Like sometimes yeah. in your life, I feel like everything can feel very serious or dire. And then when I write about it, it like, I don't know, it takes on some lightness that mm -hmm. I really need. Um, and, and it helps me process. And then I come back to my motherhood with like some, some shift, like it helps mm -hmm. shift me. It's a, I'm not saying like it cures me or something, but like it yeah. gives me some, it, it allows me to hold more compassion. I think for everyone involved, for my kids, for my partner, for myself. Yeah. And that compassion feels, uh, like a key component of, yeah. of life, like of just like being happier. Totally. Because sometimes we have to actually like give a name to something or like take an abstract thing like motherhood as an abstract concept. Right. And when you can write about it and turn it into your words, you can have a little distance from it to neutralize yeah. it a little bit. Right. So when you move forward, it's not as uh, triggering in all of the ways. Um, whenever we get an author on, I love to just ask about the book, the book writing process. What was that like? What was the whole we have a lot of people who listen to this show who are want off authors and working on everything. So what yeah. was that like? I mean, when I, f I first wrote the proposal in 2020, once I got an agent who basically convinced me to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I wrote the proposal almost with her. Like we were, but we were like on the phone for an mm. hour every week, like editing and going back mm. and forth. And once that, once it got accepted and I got an offer, I had a year to okay. write the book. And that felt incredibly scary. And <laughs> I both like need deadlines in order to yeah. do work because I'm mm -hmm. a big procrastinator. Um, but also that it felt almost paralyzing to have a year deadline. Yeah. And the thing that I knew that I could do 
and that that I was most excited about doing was talking to moms. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I started. I started with the thing that I needed to do for the book and that felt inspiring. Your way And and so I just did like tons and tons of interviews and that felt really exciting and and in retrospect, really smart. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because the interviews gave me information on like patterns, on um, on really like the issues that needed to be written about in the Mm -hmm, book. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not like, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have like a PhD in motherhood. Like I'm a mom who's a writer who has like, at this point, I feel like I'm becoming a I'm becoming an expert in mom rage and I'm definitely seen as an expert in mom rage, but like, and I, and I think that like that, uh, personal experience and other and storytelling, like other mother's stories is knowledge. And we like to act like, you know, formal education is Mm -hmm. the only knowledge. And like, I love that, uh, you know, writing is the only knowledge, which is very like white supremacist patriarchal thinking about like, what is, what is truth and what's not. And who gets to decide the truth and who, right. 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 And so it felt important to like, I feel like the, the mother's stories were like the basis of this book. Yeah. yeah. And that felt really good. I love that. And then what we're, was the, we're working ahead, on our own book proposal right now. And Olivia was like, should we have, should we have a deadline? And I was like, I don't even know how long writing a chapter of a book will take. Like, how can I have a deadline for myself? <laughs> I have no idea how that, you know, so I, I can imagine being like, well, now you have to do it in a year. It's like, I guess that's how long it takes to write a book. Yeah, <laughs> I, def- I did not make my year deadline. Yeah. I will say that. <laughs> well, you and did a lot of work, okay. yeah. a lot of interviews, a lot of interviews. Yeah. Um, and then what was it like, you know, to be published and seeing the book all over the, I mean, the book has been all over the place recently. What is that like? Um, it is, it has been a very like up and down experience. I think it was very roller coastery, kind of like right before it came out because I had all of this like anticipation about the launch and mm. I didn't have any op-eds coming out and I felt like no one was taking my op-eds. And so mm. I felt like, and like, there's this pressure on authors to publish right yeah. around the time of the launch. That's mm. just like new expectations. You don't just have to write a book. You now have right. to write essays right. that are going to get published in all these big places. Right. right. The right. week of your book. Like it's kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't getting, I have these op-eds like still on my computer. Like I, none of them really got published and you know, I got one in like smaller places, but so I, I felt like a little bit terrified. I think mm. that like my book was going to fail and I don't, I actually, people ask me all the time, like how, you know, how's the book doing? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm not asking anyone what the numbers are. I think if it was a bestseller, somebody would tell me. So I assume assume it's not a bestseller yet. Um, But anyway, the book is doing just fine. I'm very busy, like doing interviews and stuff like that. So it feels good. It feels just very thrilling to like mostly to see people reading it like and posting about it like strangers yeah (laughs) I think that's been fun like when I have a book event and like 40 people are there and I know like three of them and I'm like look at all these people who came to my event like I don't even know you how do you know about this book (laughs) you know me right (laughs) that that feels very exciting it is it's so exciting. exciting and it's so necessary that you did this because again like I said it's giving a voice to this feeling that we all feel as moms but we didn't know how to express or we were afraid to express it right and yeah. so I think that um, it's just so important so if somebody is going through a fresh start in life what would be some wise words that you could impart to them um, I would say to push all pressure not to prioritize yourself <laughs> which I think that I don't know how many of your listeners are uh, identify as women but a lot. Uh, yeah <laughs> I would say that like the world is very, um, you know, does not make it easy for women to prioritize ourselves. No. And especially I think once you become a mother, it's very much all about caretaking of like your kids and your spouse and your home, maybe your parents. Uh, And I think it is really uh, an act of self care to be like, I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm going to figure out what my needs are because I think a lot of times we don't even recognize what our needs are. But to like recognize what they are and to try and meet them step by step. I think that is like the most important thing. And like in my little fresh start story, I guess when, you know, when I started writing, 
that need, like when I, when I was putting my kid in daycare, like that was a need yes. for me. Oh yeah. So I wanted to go I back to that it. because we have a lot of people that we know that uh, either work from home or they're writers and there is an immense amount of guilt in hiring help or in putting your child in daycare if you're working from home or if you're a writer. What would you say to a, a mom who's listening who is like, but I work from home. I can do it. I can do it. Or I, I'm just writing, right? Because I struggled with this too. But you deserve to have time and space. What would you say to that woman? Um, I think that the whole world is set up for us to, especially for those of us married to men, I think that the whole world is set up for us to prioritize the man's career, often because of the gender yeah. wage gap. And so they they make more money. And so mm-hmm. we view money as something that has more value. Mm-hmm. And so we devalue our life paths and our careers. Yeah. So just because you're working from, just because you're a mom mm-hmm. or a woman and got a more quote unquote flexible career because yep. you were, because that's what, how we've been taught to do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean that, that your career is less valuable and, yeah. and deserves less attention. Yeah. And I would also say that writing is a job and just mm-hmm. because in our capitalist system, it doesn't, writing is not prioritized financially doesn't mean that we shouldn't still prioritize it. And and that's been a journey for me. Like being like, I'm, this is my writing time. And no, I will not like hang out with my parents when they come to visit from nine to five. You know what I mean? Like, I think you really have to prioritize your writing as a job, which is hard to do. Yeah. We were talking, we had Zoe Fishman on uh, the podcast and she's a novelist and she was talking about how she wrote some novels during the pandemic and how her parents would come over to help with her kids because she's a widow. And she'd Uh be like, she was like, okay, I'm going to the garage to write. And they were like, what are you doing? She was like, I have to go write, like away from you all. So Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) you know, so I, I, I I respect that so much. And I struggled with the same thing myself. I mean, I work from home always. And um, I just, there's an immense amount of guilt, right? To say like, oh no, we could totally do it all. And then you're, you burn out like immediately. Well, it's the thing too of being like convenient, right? Like I work from home. And so the thing of being like, well, I can get dinner started. And like, you need a partner that's going to be like, no, like uh, pull you back from that sort of like self-sacrifice martyrdom. Cause it's, yep. it's what we're taught. It really right. is. Right. And, and I also want to say that even if you're not, you know, quote unquote, working from home, like even if you are identify as a stay at home mm-hmm. parent, mm-hmm. like you still get to make that choice if yeah. what you need is to not be parenting 24 seven. If you have yeah. the financial resources to have childcare and yeah. that feels good to you, you still get to make that choice. Yes. You don't have to be making money or like be an artist in order to yeah. put your kid in childcare. Yeah. If you can, you could just be a human who needs I, space. I, I yeah. like that. Space. Casey yeah. Davis has her thing is like equal rest time that each partner should have equal rest time because yes. this idea that like stay at home moms, like, yeah, they're home with the kids all day. And then the dad comes home and he needs time off. It's like, what about her? What about the time off that the mom gets? So equal rest time, I think, is a good framing device for that because it's like, and but, you know, equal time to be a human and take a shower and, you know. I love that. I've never heard that term, like equal that. rest time. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's very entwined with your work. Um, <laughs> last question, hardest question of all. What was the last thing that you ate and really loved? Um, I think I might say my breakfast today. I had, <laughs> love it. <laughs> it was like a standard breakfast for me. I had oatmeal mm-hmm. and I had sauteed kale on top of it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a over medium egg on top, oh, a little bit of tomato and some uh, Cholula. Ooh, so ah, And I love that's That's a standard breakfast for you. It's not all the time. There, okay. have been mo- there have been times in my life where I was like eating this every day. Now it's a little bit less, but like, so it feels like a treat right now because yeah. I'm not eating it every day anymore. I just love that. Like that does not sound like a meal that's quick to make. And I like that you take the time to make a meal that is really yummy and satisfying to you. I think yeah. that's beautiful. Thanks. I love that. Well, for anybody listening, go read Mom Rage. It is wonderful. And uh, you are wonderful. And I we just appreciate you being here and using your voice and your words to give other women a voice because that's how we're going to change the next generation of moms and help them and support them. So we appreciate you and thank you. And we will obviously link to the book and all the good things in our show notes. And uh, we'll talk to you when your next book comes out, Mina. So. <laughs> 
Thank you. And thank you for your work. I feel like, you know, there's like some symbiosis here with like yeah. the work that you're doing to support mothers. Like, I feel like we're all thank in this you. business of like trying to support moms. So thanks trying for having to save me. the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's story. We're always here and we're so proud of you. A Fresh Story is produced by Fresh Starts Registry, the first and only platform for everything you need to begin again. You can read the show notes and learn more about today's episode at afreshstory.com.